delightful to have all of you here. I'm Stephen Toop, and I have the honor to serve as President of the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences. And I want to welcome each and every one of you here this afternoon for the first of Congress 2017's Big Thinking Series. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge that Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We at the Federation are grateful, of course, as well, for the hard work and preparations undertaken by our host, Ryerson University, and we look forward to a wonderful week thanks to their hospitality. J'aimerais signaler, avant de commencer, que nous proposons un service d'interprétation simultanée au moyen de votre téléphone cellulaire. Les détails se trouvent à l'entrée de l'auditorium et sur les chevelets près de la strade. Je souhaite remercier le Conseil de recherche en sciences humaines, la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation et Université Canada pour leur parrainage de la série de causeries Voir Grande. It's thanks to the generosity of these sponsors that we're able to make these events open to the public for all to enjoy. I also want to extend a special thank you to the sponsor for today's Big Thinking, the Canada Foundation for Innovation. As we consider Canada's past and future, prompted by the Congress theme, the next 150 on Indigenous lands, this Big Thinking series gives us an opportunity to explore issues that transform, I hope inspire, and challenge us and today is certainly no exception. We're delighted to welcome three well-known voices to the stage, award-winning essayist and novelist and distinguished visiting professor at Ryerson, John Ralston Saul, Olivia Chow, who is also a distinguished visiting professor here at Ryerson, and Niganwedwidam, James Sinclair, head of the Department of Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. Now I would like to invite Pierre Normand, Vice President of External Relations and Communications at the Canada Foundation for Innovation to introduce our speakers in more detail. Welcome, Pierre, and thank you. Merci, Stephen. Bonjour à tous. C'est un très grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui au nom de la Fondation canadienne pour l'innovation, alors que nous lançons la série 2017 des conférences Voix Grand dans le cadre du Congrès des sciences humaines qui se tient cette semaine à l'Université Ryerson. The uh, Canada Foundation for Innovation has uh, helped to support this uh, very important lecture series for a number of years now. You see, at the uh, CFI, we believe in the power of ideas and scholarship to help address the big issues of our time. But it's also because thinking big is one of the ideals upon which the uh, CFI was created. And it is also what will sustain the next generation of researchers and scholars over the next decades. Today's panel uh, kicks off an impressive series of presentations over the next few days. Au cours des prochains jours, vous aurez l'occasion d'entendre des chercheurs dont les idées et les travaux nous aident à réfléchir aux questions complexes qui marquent uh, notre époque et influence la société. And um, what better way to start this series as we get ready to celebrate Canada 150 to ask ourselves a few questions. Is uh, Canada built on the ideals of inclusion, diversity and full citizenship? Where did, where did these ideals come from? Are we living up to them? Where are they going? What will community and Canadian citizenship mean in the 21st century, and how can we reach these ideals? Well, to help us address these questions today, it is now my pleasure to introduce our three panelists. John Ralston Saul est un essayiste et romancier primé. Ses ouvrages les plus récents, qui examinent la remarquable résurgence du pouvoir autochtone au Canada, ont grandement influencé les discussions nationales sur la question. 
Ses écrits sur l'immigration et la citoyenneté font d'ailleurs de lui un spécialiste sur ce sujet. M. Saul est le président sortant de Penn International, le cofondateur et coprésident de l'Institut pour, pour la citoyenneté canadienne et de 6 degrés espace citoyen. Il est compagnon de l'Ordre du Canada, membre de l'Ordre de l'Ontario et chevalier de l'Ordre des arts et des lettres de France. Olivia Chow is a public figure, politician and distinguished visiting uh, professor here at Ryerson University. She was born in Hong Kong and moved to Toronto with her parents when she was 13. Her political career began in 1985 when she was elected to the Toronto Board of Education. In 1991, she was uh, elected a, uh, as a Metro Toronto councillor, where she served for 14 years. In 2006, she was elected as a member of parliament and won re-election twice. She is founder of the Institute for Change Leaders, an organization that teaches community and political organizing strategies. Negan Wewidam James Sinclair is Anashi Nabi, an associate professor at the University of Manitoba. He is an award-winning writer, editor, and activist. In fact, named by Monocle magazine as one of Canada's top 20 most influential people, he is also one of the CBC Manitoba's top 40 under 30, under, under 40, pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I fixed it. <laughs> numbers is not, is not our thing after all. <laughs> he is a regular commentator on indigenous issues on CTV, CBC, and on the Aboriginal People's Television Network. His first book on Anishinaabeg literary traditions will be coming out in 2017 with the University of Minnesota, Minnesota Press. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists today. Thank you very much, Pierre. And as uh, Pierre suggested, we're going to begin the conversation this afternoon by thinking about uh, our current ideals of inclusion, diversity, and citizenship in Canada and try to explore a little bit where they came from. Uh, Nigan, let's start with you. So I, first I'm going to apologize in that I'm going to stand up, which is the whole point. We have, we're sitting down here, but I'm going to stand up for a couple little bit here. So. Uh, so, Bojon de Nwe Maganaduk, Nigan Wewudum Nadijna Kos, Namagoshin Dodem, Niman Wendam Omayayan, Namagoshin Bangi Gisnagwajing. It's a nice day out there. I want to acknowledge all of our relatives out there. I also want to acknowledge a lot of my students that are here from Manitoba. So, we're in, we're in the Toronto territory now. I got to act different, just so you know. Okay? <laughs> so, so uh, Miigwech. I want to uh, say hello to my relations. Bonjour, de Nguyen Magaduk. Hello, my relations. Through the Mississauga, you are my relations in this territory. So I want to say miigwech for that. I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to go as quickly as I can. But I also want to say that this is a, uh, a very vibrant, uh, deep intellectual tradition I'm going to talk about. However, I'm going to do a terrible job on trying to encapsulate it in a few minutes. So uh, if we were to talk about the Indigenous archive, we were to talk about where we get text or where ultimately we get law and citizenship, we have to look to text. We have to look to the written tradition of Indigenous peoples and a sense of authorship that is tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands, millennia old, and it is written by more than human beings. The very first thing that we have to get out of the idea is that, tech, that human centrism is probably one of the most devastating and Western ideals that has been brought to this territory. That for us, text is not just created by ourselves, but also by all of our relatives around us. So the indigenous archive knowledge bases are based in these places. These are the libraries of North America. Um, not only do we contribute to that library, as you can see right here with the petroforms of Manitoba, bottom left, but also there are other textual creators, bears, water, earth, birds, plants, and that these things have ideas to offer for all of us, particularly around citizenship. Citizenship is the way that we have been looking at the world for a long time. And if we were to say, you know, as indigenous peoples, as an international set of nations that have been here and changing and growing for thousands and thousands of years, uh, indigenous North America, 
indigenous, the Turtle Island, looked like the scene on the left. And now, for those of us who are Anishinaabe, looks like the scene on the right. So uh, we were just in The Hague recently, John and I speaking to the United Nations and people other, you know, other elsewhere over there on the program called Six Degrees. What I said was, uh, to think of indigenous you know, territory, it would be somewhat similar to kind of how we think of European unions. And that we would, you know, it's multi-leveled nations inside of a nation or a national identity. And so uh, it's not the same, obviously, but it might be a good way to start to think about it. And that indigenous nationhood is, it was a constantly moving entity. And so we had senses of adoption. We learn those from the world around us. And so that when we look to the world around us in the archive and we engage with the archive, much like we do in intellectual traditions today, when we went to our universities, our lodges, and we engaged in intellectual discussions on trying to understand how did the world work? How did the stars, the earth, the plants, the animals interact with one another? And what can we gain from that? We develop notions like the clan system, which you can see today, I'm wearing my Namagoshin Dodem, my trout my trout relatives, and when uh, we came together, then when Europeans showed up, it was simply a new addition. It wasn't the addition, and I think that is probably one of the biggest faults that into intellectual textbooks, uh, intellectual production has created is that Europeans were thought as a new thing. They were just another thing. It was like another storm, or it was a rainfall, or if it was a changing of the season. It wasn't the thing. So when I see a textbook, for example, with six pages at the start, sort of showing, throwing, showing people in loincloth and throwing spears, and then suddenly Europeans get a 480 pages, I think that there, there is ongoing intellectual colonialism. When we adopted and we offered things like names, like Kanata, the village, when we offered that to Karche, when Karche was looking for the riches, we said, the riches are actually in Kanata. And he wrote Canada on the map, imagining it to be spices and gold, which we now imagine to be oil pipelines, diamonds, and shale gas. We're still looking for Canada, but that we're never going to find it. What we're looking for is Kanata. The riches are in the village, our interrelationships to each other. Through processes of specifically adoption, but what I would call Nibakjigan, Nibakjiganan, which is gift-giving processes, relationships were formed and families were made which is why treaties are about family-making vessels. They're not about land sales. They're not used car sales. You actually have to go for dinner with your used car salesman. And so treaties are processes of family-making forever. That's what those were on. And that we might share different parts of the house and be separate, but ultimately we have shared territory as well in which we interact with one another. That's the Tura Wampum, that's the Geshwentha, which is the foundational treaty model in which many other indigenous nations utilized. Now this process, in which when we offered to other nations, we drew upon our creation stories which said that things had an entire system in which others could come, uh, others were simply to be recognized within the system itself. So Wawiak, Wawiak, there is a complete system. And Nwendawin, we are connected with all of those things. And so citizenship, if we were to sort of to begin, begin to describe that, we would say when individuals come into our families, they then inherit a set of responsibilities, not because we demand them of them, but because to be a good, effective family member, you gotta do the dishes once in a while. You gotta shovel the snow. You gotta keep the house a little tidy. And ultimately, the betterment of the entire of the family is where we benefit, not in the individual. Can you imagine what a family would be like if one person in the family did very, very well, built uh, marble uh, countertops and huge big screen TVs in some part of the house, but ultimately in other areas of the house, people were suffering. You couldn't drink the water. The young women of the area were facing danger every day of their life. The young men were taken away and put into jails, locked into closets. Can you imagine what that would be like? That would be a pretty dysfunctional family. Well, welcome to Canada, not Kanata. What the intention was, was for Indigenous people to begin to create more life, or what we refer to as Minobamadzuin, as Anishinaabe. Of course, I'm speaking very Anishinaabe-centric here, by the way. Right? But Minobamadzuin, which is that life is best when life begats more life. The good life is created when everybody has an opportunity to have a good life. Now, that's not what happened, is it? All right? What's happened is, starting in 1763 with the Royal Proclamation, notions of ownership were imposed, property. 
that leads all the way into the current appropriation debate where now art is also considered to be property and we're also dividing up lines onto who and what and how. But ultimately, these discussions have to be about responsibility because that is what Indigenous peoples have offered to people throughout time in that if you're going to be an effective part of a family, then therefore you carry responsibilities, not so much rights. Responsibilities are truly about how we make an effective family together. And whether it be in the time of I don't know more, or whether it be in the time of Oka, or whether it be in the time of resistance to the white paper, or ultimately today in 2017, it is us constantly trying to tell those of us around us, specifically Canadians, read the earth. Uh, in fact, I would say that that's probably one of the biggest struggles in North America, is trying to get those who are, at times, we question your literacy. Because the world around us teaches us to live one way, the archive teaches us one way, and yet we see, keep continuing to go for shale gas and oil, and we keep doing that in a very illiterate, self-destructive way. I want to show you what indigenous citizenship actually looks like, and we'll see if this actually works. Oh, that's not what it works, so you got to press the video up there then. In uh, December of 2012, we held a celebration. People in Cree territory out in Saskatchewan, 4,000 people joined together in a mall at Christmas time to say, we can be more than what we have inherited. We can be more, we can truly be a family if you step up and you dance for yourself. And by doing that, you, this is the, actually what Kanata looks like. For 15 minutes, we did it at a, at a time in Idle No More. And this is an indigenous intellectual tradition that we learned in our creation stories hundreds of thousands of years ago, millennia ago, and that we continue to try to teach Canada today, and that being an effective citizen, whether it be we call it democracy or whether we call it multiculturalism, which are those things that we had taught Canadians to do, not, we weren't the only teachers, of course, but we were the main teachers for democracy, UN peacekeeping, multiculturalism, and we continue to do it today in places like malls, the place that divides us, where we still look for Canada, not Kanata. Miigwech, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigan. Uh, so citizenship, indigenous citizenship as family and a sense of strong responsibility and mutual responsibility. Olivia, what do you add to that? I'm following the lead and I'll stand up <laughs> too. Stand up too. <laughs> Don't I apologize. Slide, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then other things came. Other things like the Chinese uh, workers handing gold, and they had a very respectful, friendly relationship with people in the First Nations all along on the Fraser River. Some intermarried, and, um, and many of the Chinese stayed and built the railroad that actually destroyed, unfortunately, a lot of the land that uh, indigenous people had. And if you think about it, it is the same kind of mentality that this is a white man country, this is what a former prime minister said, that led to the indigenous people being pushed out, and a bit of it is greed also, that the lands have been taken, but it's also the same kind of mentality and the thought that ended up having the Chinese head tax imposed and Chinese being excluded in Canada after they helped build the railroad. Or the Japanese Canadian that have their land confiscated and they were interned, even though they are second, third generation, or, uh, and they are Canadians. It's the same kind of mentality that said no to the Sikh that was coming into Canada. Um, uh, the the uh, Kumakata Maru, the, the ship that end up being pushed away, and a lot of sick end up uh, losing the lives when they were returned, and of course the SS St. Louis, where 900 Jewish people, well, 
over 250 of them passed away. It's that kind of mentality that we need to say no to, and I thank goodness that we've learned so much from it. But it is also our need to recognize that history and then move beyond that and have all of us come together and said that, well, you know, we are, we are the new people that arrived. And yet a lot of new immigrants really don't understand that piece of the history and do not understand what McGann have just talked about. And if we can connect with each other by saying it is the colonial and the white mentality that are now past, hopefully, that we can create a new Canada that is evolving, that's inclusive, that is diverse, that people are able to contribute and make a difference collectively. That's the real sense of citizenship that we can do together. John, ideals of inclusion, diversity, citizenship, what do you see as the Half possibility? Up. He's going to partially Half stand. Up. No, no, no. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Go. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we know each other pretty well. We've talked about these things, and again, I've talked about these things in different parts of the country. And, and I think what's so interesting is that you, university people, are faced with this dilemma. And the dilemma is that we're start, we know a lot about what was done wrong now. I mean, you know, frankly, for an intellectual, once the uh, Royal Commission, George Erasmus, had happened, there was no longer any excuse for anybody in a university not to understand, because it was one of the greatest research projects in the history of this country. Everything was put out there. It was there. Government didn't want it. They didn't read it. But a, a lot of other people did read it. And it's fantastically well written as well. So there's no excuse of boredom, because it's not like one of those PhDs. It's actually a fabulous bit of thousands of pages of writing and, and documentation. And so we know a lot. We know a lot about the head text. We know a lot about uh, uh, what was done to uh, the racism that was instituted. And we know now a lot, and we're going to know more, about what was done to indigenous people. Um, what we're not so good at is explaining how, having made all those mistakes, which which I often describe as the, the inheritance of the European tradition, which is to say the inheritance of the uh, uh, Westphalian nation state obsession with creating a nation state in which one race, one religion, uh, one language, one mythology will dominate. And it is the job of whoever can get the most guns uh, to get the most land and to eliminate everybody else or to force them to become just like the dominant group, and to create totally fallacious ideas like um, uh, les Gaulois, whereas anybody who does anything about France knows there are very few Gaulois in France. And it, it, in order to create that nation state, you, know, you had to eliminate, eliminate, eliminate. And you had to have, in the 20th century, two gigantic civil wars with 100 million dead people in order to prove that you could have, that it was possible to have a Westphalian nation state. So in many ways, that's our European inheritance, and I hate to say it, that's what our universities are built on. Our, uh, the structures of our universities are the structures of European universities, and I hate to say it, that's what led to the Westphalian nation state, and that's what led to a great deal of the evil that was done, in, and to some extent continues to be done in this country. Because there's still a lot of the evil being done on the, uh, to indigenous people by existing laws of underfunding education, dirty water, uh, crappy schools, you name it. It's all still there. Those, those things are there for the isolated community. And there are just enormous numbers of uh, unresolved issues. And you, through your taxes, continue to fund a handful of federal lawyers in the Justice of Department uh, to spend $125 million of your dollars per year, of your taxes per year, on fighting against justice for indigenous people. <laughs> this is reality. Right. And yet, on the other hand, we're you know, among the most successful countries in the world in uh, figuring out how to have many different sorts of people live together. And to bring in almost 1% of our population a year, and uh, you know, 
um, uh, eighty-six percent of immigrants to Canada become citizens within five years. The United States is about forty percent, and Europe is about eight or nine percent. So these are really there are some really interesting things happening, some really interesting success stories, along with carrying the burden of the Westphalian nation state and having not yet managed to rediscover and reinvent, because in fact, Nagan is saying rediscover and you're saying reinvent, but we're, we're, all, we're saying the same thing, rediscover and reinvent the possibility of another idea of citizenship, another idea of belonging, another idea of what is a nation, what is a nation state, how do people live together. This idea of multiple personalities, of multiple layers, of multiple loyalties, this is really, really interesting stuff. And Europe is, is crashing over it. They can't get away from the old idea. The United States is in deep crisis over it. To some extent, we're holding on. But I can promise you this. We will not be able to hold on if we don't do two things. One of them is to resolve the necessary justice uh, uh, that belongs to indigenous people and which we are preventing from happening. And secondly, that we actually work consciously to rethink how, the, how we think about the history of this place, how we think about the philosophy of this place, how we think about citizenship, the legality of citizenship and, and, and differences. And we explain it properly to people. And, and you, know, you go to place after place, this history is not properly explained. So I think there's an enormous opportunity for us, which has to do with both carrying the burden of the wrongs, uh, rediscovering and reinventing. And, 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 and my last line would simply be this, and I've said this again and again and again, and I'm just gonna, it, it, things have to be repeated. There is no other possible explanation for the successful side of immigration and citizenship in Canada. There is no possible explanation for the roots of it except indigenous people. It is not English, it is not French, it is not German, it is not European, it is not Westphalian, it is not race-based, so if, you know, as intellectuals say, where does it come from? It was not invented by Pierre Trudeau in 1972 with multiculturalism or whatever. It goes back 500 years, it goes back thousands of years. It's a continuity, it's very interesting, but we have to embrace that. You have to be able to stand up in the morning and say, our immigration citizenship policy is based on indigenous principles. If you can do that, you're gonna teach your courses differently and you're gonna organize your universities differently. So indigeneity is the very basis for a multiplicity, uh, a, an open-spirited idea of citizenship. Uh, can we talk about concretely how, how can this happen in Canada more fully than we've certainly achieved to date? Uh, any examples, Olivia, of good practices or even best practices where, where we are getting some things right? Uh, small but growing. The research that's done to connect the First Nation and the early Chinese settlers was very interesting and, and needs to broaden. There are lots of connections from because we are in their land, right? So to pick up what John was talking about. There are also other examples. Uh, Parks Canada recently have joined with other companies where they offer trips where you would go into, let's say, the Firth River, which is in the Northwest Territory, flows out to the Beaufort Sea, and the guides, the Parks Canada guides that come along are, in fact, two of them are from their community, indigenous community, that are able to teach about the culture, their history, uh, use of medicine in the, uh, the herbs, the plants, and yet those are really small pilot things. Banff, for example, have huge number of people descending upon it every year. Why can't all of Parks Canada programs or all our very sacred land that we that Miguel talked about? Why can't that be recognized? The history of it, the people in that land recognized, understood, and then the, the, the uh, heritage or the culture, the wisdom, the language of the First Nation people would then be
be integrated into that. There are so many examples, that, and there are missed opportunities too. English as second language classes teach a huge number of immigrants, right? But if you look at the curriculum, there's not much about the history or the heritage or the language or the culture, right? So there are many things that we can do, but so creativity, uh, integration through our day-to-day -day working, especially through our government that can form some kind of structure. And I keep thinking, you know, the raven and the dragons. Wow. Raven. Meeting. Huh? I mean, ravens, well, you know, the hide of people with ravens with the creation of the, the creation with the, the mythology and the dragon also. There's lots of really interesting connections. So if we can create some clear um, through arts, through culture, where we could really understand each other and connect and create a new sense of identity, that would be fabulous. Nigan, you were commenting earlier about how the, the real crucible for these sets of issues is in Canada, in Manitoba, and in Saskatchewan. Uh, not so much in Toronto, not so much even on the West Coast. Any, any best practices or examples of working through these ideals in a productive way that you could, uh, you could share with us? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I want to give kudos, of course, to Ontario and, and other places, and, and particularly British Columbia, because there are some interesting struggles uh, that have uh, that achievements in that area. So, but what I do teach is, you know, Winnipeg, and particularly Winnipeg, and I'm biased, by the way, my students over there, this here's a way to upset the crowd. Uh, you, you know, we, we're often classifying Manitoba and Saskatchewan as racism capitals, violence capitals, you know, whatever challenge, poverty, uh, whatever. But frankly, we're at the front lines of the most challenging issue this country's facing, which is reconciliation with Indigenous people. And guess who's, guess who's uh, finding solutions on a, on a daily basis? It's our communities. It's not Toronto, and it's not Vancouver as, as on wide scales. They are, of course, many successful projects. Here, here's the issue with the country. Uh, racism is the, is the fabric of the country. And what I mean by that is, is uh, terra nullius is, the, is law. It's the, it's the foundational law within the Roe Proclamation which turns into the British North America Act in Section 9124, controls Indians and lands reserved for Indians, uh, federal designation, and then of course that just, then the dominoes just fall. Then the Indian Act, then residential schools, and then the 60s scoop, and, and all of that emerges out of senses of property and ownership and ultimately start struggles for land theft. And so, I mean, because that's such a fabric of the country, it's, with, it's within every breath of federal parliament that that is uh, that that's taking on, and so what I'd say is the Royal Commission is a is a solution model, solution based model. One of the solutions they offered, of course, is a, a Indigenous Parliament, and you know we're always wondering what to do with the Senate. I mean, there's a there's a solution, <laughs> and you, because you can actually have Indigenous people truly actually be part of the the part of the country instead of simply accepting uh, you know a waste of time apologies, and so. What I'd say is in Manitoba, it's, we're doing it all the time. Um, you know, Manitoba, uh, we do it everything from, uh, we do work now for Manitoba, Manitowabo, Manitoapi, uh, Manitousisis, right? So those are three names that describe the power comes from the water, the power comes from the land, or the, the life comes from the water, life comes from the land, and the life comes from the movement of the water. There's nothing more indigenous, by the way, than three definitions for the same thing. And we're doing it all the time. That's multiplicity. That's mm -hmm. diversity. That's, that, is a, a, that is a definition of it. And we do it, um, a lot of people do it in, in territorial acknowledgments. That's important because it's a part of citizenship. But it gets framed in ownership yet again. People think that we're acknowledging that the Anishinaabe or the Cree own that territory. Therefore, we are guests on it in some way. And I think that's an important dialogue to have because we are talking about land theft. But ultimately, um, if you ask indigenous people, how do we view treaty, we're actually talking about family making. And so the most, you know, the University of Manitoba and, uh, has a territorial acknowledgement in which the second line, I think, is way more important than the first line. And it says, we commit ourselves to healthy relationships on this land. And so for me, that's treaty. That's what treaty is about. And so many of my colleagues from University of Manitoba are here. And so, I mean, we, we're working very hard to try to engage ourselves in in ethical debates and conversations around what it means to be a treaty person. And that leads into even conversations where the Winnipeg Jets, I work with the Winnipeg Jets, and they're doing a territorial acknowledgement. Here's why that's important. 
There's probably no more important time to talk about healthy and positive relationships on territory than on events where we're celebrating the violent removal of territory and the achievement of that. That's football, that's baseball, that's hockey. That's what, you know, violent removal of territory is the epitome of these sports, and we should talk about treaty before we do these events. And, you know, whether it be uh, people in the north end of Winnipeg constantly adopting and bringing in people into organizations to deal with poverty and, and the murder missing Indigenous women um, plague of this country, um, or whether it be uh, dealing with young men, taking them on the land, or, or trying to, uh, you know, when I take young people out and I say, let's look at what's alive in the world. And turns out everything is. <laughs> and so that unearths terra nullius. And hopefully one of those people enter into parliament and, and you know, radically change the foundation of the country. But everybody's scared of Meech Lake and Charlottetown. And everyone's scared of having a found foundational debate of what the country really means. And that's really what's stopping us. John, you've been thinking about these issues for a very long time. You actually are co-chair of, of an entity that thinks about citizenship. Uh, and good. the gun's on the board. Great. <laughs> Glad recently. to hear it. Just recently. <laughs> I'm not officially. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. So I want uh, uh, some examples from what you've seen across the country uh, of, of good practices. Well, uh, let me, I think it's quite interesting just to, to, to be boring and to stick with this, this, this thing of the acknowledgement at the beginning of public ceremonies. Just arrived in Toronto, what, five years ago, probably, from the West. Um, and, and I often now, uh, now that people are used to it, I often say to them, now you do realize, I mean, of course it's a politeness, and it's a form of protocol, and there's no civilization without protocol. People have a hard time believing that, but it is true. And, um, but, but what you've just done by not walking out of the room when Mr. Toop said that we were on this land, what you've just done is you have disassociated yourself from common law and civil code. You have actually said, and you're intellectual, so you must know this, you've actually said that you think that civil code and common law is barbaric and simplistic. I'm looking, Sakesh Henderson's sitting right there, so I'm a little nervous when I'm talking about stuff like this. But you know, you're, 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 you're actually admitting that this idea that you just buy and sell land, and if I'm the owner, I'm the owner, and too bad for you, and there are a few laws limiting me, but very few, that this is actually barbaric and superficial. And therefore, British civilization, the natural inheritor of Greece and Rome, unless you think French civilization is the natural inheritor of Greece and Rome, or German, there's a little discussion among them that's been going on. And, uh, but if you don't believe that, then what you're really saying is that, yeah, they had Shakespeare, but they're pretty barbaric. They're civilizations. When it comes to understanding the relationship to land, which comes back in a way to what Nagan was saying at the beginning. We, we're in a very interesting situation where people have admitted to the possibility of another idea of the land, even if it's only very preliminary, They've admitted to an introduction of spirituality at the beginning of all public ceremonies, thanks to indigenous people, which is almost no opposition to it. It's really interesting that, you know, the, all this spirituality coming at the beginning linked to the land again. Now what we have to have is a serious conversation about what does that mean? How does that actually work? And that's what Olivia was talking about, about going on those trips and having explained this is how the land works. This is what our relationship to land is. When I did a book, I don't know, maybe on equilibrium, maybe something sort of 15 years ago. And I remember there's a chapter in there on animism. And I said, what are we talking 15 years ago? And I remember going to academics and saying, well, what can I say about animism? And there's, you know, just the rejection of animism in the mid to late 19th century as being barbaric as part of social Darwinism, which is all part of organizing the domination of the white race and all this. Um, you, you could, it was risky to write a chapter on animism as a mainstream movement. Whereas today, Canadians are actually very comfortable with this idea of the, the, uh, the well, I guess, uh, 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 the, dy the dynamism, which is the essential nature of civilization, as opposed to fixed laws. Fixed laws and fixed ownership. This is a very interesting intellectual ownership. And, and we're going to talk about what we should be doing, right? So That's where I want to get to now. Yeah. So why don't you just start? What about so, structurally? How well, do we so change this? Structurally, what I've just said means, and I, tell me if you disagree. Structurally, what it means is you have to completely rethink departments of philosophy. We have to stop being the footnotes of European philosophy. 
Immanuel Kant is brilliant, Rousseau's, you know, a lovely, you know, French romantic, Swiss French romantic, whatever, about nature. We have to actually rethink how we teach philosophy and what we teach philosophy. And I'm not talking about having a nice course, which we should have on the side, which is optional on various special issues, which might include indigenous issues. I'm talking about putting indigenous philosophy into the core of philosophy 101, so that we're actually, you know, we're actually teaching Richard Atlio and uh, who else? I mean, I'm just trying to think of names here. Leroy Little Bear. Mm -hmm. Basil Johnson. Yeah, in our philosophy department. And on the way, we might actually include Harold Innes and, and Marshall McLuhan. We've eliminated everything that isn't European pretty well in order to stay in this catastrophic road in terms of the kind of country we're trying to be. And so we have to rebuild. I think philosophy is the place to start. I think the second place to go is, is, is things like departments of English and departments of French. I mean, here's a country, you know, we've been talking mainly indigenous. Here's a country which is officially bilingual, and yet it teaches literature and culture as if they have nothing to do with each other. They are footnotes of France and England. They are incapable, the universities, of actually teaching English and French as part of the experience here, we have to follow down the imported route. That is a big, big problem. We're, we've structured our universities in order to deny the possibility of the existence of this place. <laughs> and then we make some exceptions. We make some exceptions. You know, law is actually ahead of, of everybody because really from early in the 20th century, law had a couple of places that taught at least civil and and common law together, and if I remember talking to members of the Supreme Court a few years ago when I was doing Fair Country, and I said, tell me, tell me, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the French version of law and the English version of law changed over the centuries in Canada. Obviously, since we have federal law and we have a Supreme Court, they've influenced each other. Now, tell me, what about the influence of indigenous law on federal law? And all the Supreme Court members I spoke to, I mean, being discreet because I don't know why, but anyway. Um, uh, but the most important people in the Supreme Court um, uh, said to me, no, no, the, the influence of indigenous law on federal law is enormous. Obviously not on the Department of Indian Affairs and the way it handles <laughs> treaties, and, you know, but that the fundamental understanding of law was heavily influenced over the centuries by indigenous concepts of law. Yeah. Olivia, what about uh, your experience here in thinking through structural change that might be required? Well, uh, I think if you're talking about university, I think each of the department can consider how it can, the integration. Because a lot of my experience have been in government uh, and just looking at school curriculum, mm -hmm. right? It, I, I got a book from um, Facing History and Ourselves, which talk about stolen lives and it ta it's fought with uh, Theodore Fontaine, uh, one of your relatives, and uh, writing, and it's a very, very good curriculum, but it's not integrated. It's always on the side. These things are always on the side. So I think in each department, each levels of government, especially in the federal government, I think there needs to be a systematic review of looking at each department to say, how are we going to integrate this, whether it's the history or the practice of the language or uh, all of these elements, and, and finance, okay? especially finance. Uh, what does it mean for it to be changed dramatically, systematically? If we don't do that, then it's always piecemeal, it's always on the side, it's always a pilot project. Yes. It's always best, best practices. So until you do that structural change, it's not going to really have a dramatic impact. Nikan? Yeah, I mean, structural changes, all, I really all my short answer is the 94 calls to action is the, it's the, it is the roadmap for structural change throughout every segment of the, uh, the, cult, the, the, com, the country. Now, there's certain sections that are missing in the, in the calls. I think gender is not handled very well. I don't think land's handled very well. And, and particularly in terms of, um, you know, in terms of sexual identity and general identity, I think that's not handled very well within the report. However, we are talking about a report. We have the Royal Commission in which 
frankly, that's 400 recommendations. We've got 94 recommendations here. And um, here's the biggest problem with the country. If you want a structural change right here, well, I, I would say first off that we need to recognize that Aristotle and Plato came from a place and a time that didn't happen here. And, and I know that that hurts people's minds to hear it, but when I teach aesthetics and philosophy, I say that is one way to view it from a particular area of the world, from a particular people who believe a certain set of ideals. Yeah, exactly. That's true. And, and that it is not an altruistic capital T truth. And therefore, the forms and the caves, the shadows on the wall, that's not us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that is one way of seeing the world, though, and that's important, but we, can, we, can, we have our ways to see it. So I'd say that first off about the university. What I'd say is that here's the biggest problem, I think, with the country. I was there when uh, Prime Minister Trudeau presented, uh, was presented with the sacred flash drive. We didn't want to give six volumes out to everybody. You know? <laughs> so we, gave the we smudged the sacred flash drive and then handed it over <laughs> with the report. And he got the sacred flash drive and while holding it said, we commit, like literally a minute and a half after the report's been released, right. he says, we commit to the 94 calls to action. Mm. That is the biggest problem in the country, is that we are treated as political tools for, for personal benefit. And it, that is disgusting, because I knew exactly what was going to happen. Well, what exactly was going to happen is they were going to step away from it within seconds, and that's exactly what's happened. Was there good things that happened? Yes, absolutely. I think he should have committed to, a, to the inquiry on murder missing Indigenous women right there. He would have got the same amount of applause, and that was an actual commitment that they have now attempted, whether successful or not, are attempting to complete. They would have got that, that same applause, and if you wanted the applause, do that. Don't create a massive sense of disappointment amongst Indigenous people, particularly who came out in droves to support this government coming in. I think it was generally, uh, we didn't want Harper anymore. But, <clears throat> but that being said, we, you know, what's happened since is they've withdrawn from UNDRIP. They've withdrawn from most of the calls to action. And they've said, yeah, these things are not doable, or we're going to do them piecemeal. Well, guess what that is? That's 150 years of the same garbage that we've experienced from going on for, for uh, and for me, I see very little hope now. I see less hope and more anger now in our communities around this government than, I, than they deserve, really. You know? And frankly, it's, uh, it's uh, very disappointing that we continue to be treated as political pawns, and that's structural change. Mm -hmm. And, we and have to, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to have to open up now because we have a chance to uh, hear from uh, people who may uh, have some questions. There's a mic uh, right in the center. So anyone, please come forward. Vous uh, pouvez poser des questions ou en français ou en anglais. And uh, we will have just a few minutes and then we'll wrap up because we have to promise to get you off to your next events afterwards. So please, if there are any questions, I may go back to you. No, go ahead, please. Hello, uh, um, uh, thanks so much. Um, here's my question. Um, it's about the uh, linkage between um, two things, uh, between uh, citizenship and uh, overcoming um, the so-called uh, white colonial mentality. I agree that um, that's a big concern. So I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of all of the, the people in front of me here. Um, but I st I'm not convinced, honestly, that I, um, I think there's so much more to citizenship than just confronting this important issue that I'm uh, learning from you about. Okay, so I, I'm with you, right? But I think citizenship is just, just more than that. So I, if, I don't know if you can um, do anything with that comment, but that was it. Okay. Well, so, I mean, I, I think, John. You, you, know, you're, you know, we've got an hour. I think we, you know, we wanted to talk about one part of this, which is, an incre which is probably the single most important issue on the table at the moment. You know, it's, if you were to say, what's the big unresolved issue in the country? This is the big, I don't know if unresolved is the right word, undealt with you know, issue in the country where there's the most injustice. And it's not simply about treaties, it's actually about breaking the most basic rules of citizenship, which is human rights. Because, you know, uh, underfunding education for indigenous kids is a removal of freedom of speech and, and human rights. And I could go through the list. Yep. So this is actually the biggest, you know, we have a whole bunch of issues. This is the biggest issue unresolved in the country. 
uh, and undealt with and, and dishonestly dealt with in the country. Um, but I, I think that you know, what I was trying to get at, and I think we we're all trying to get at is, we have to start to try to reinvent uh, how we're going to talk about citizenship, what we mean by citizenship. So you've heard that you know, we've started this thing called Six Degrees Citizen Space. So it's not just once a year. It happens all year. But it's an attempt to create a serious public discussion about how are we going to talk about immigration, refugees, diversity, belonging, citizenship. Can we create a new language? The fact is, after 500 years, 150 years of confederation, you ask any prime minister of Canada, so tell me about citizenship in Canada. It's one sentence at best, because there isn't even a paragraph. Oh, we're better, or we're nice, or I don't know what in God's name. You know, we really have to learn how to talk about this. And if we're going to do that, we have to really invent a whole different discourse to talk about it. And that different discourse means uh, understanding the history, understanding that, that the indigenous role is not simply historic. It's actually more and more influential. And, uh, and, I'll, uh, and, and that, that we've done a lot of things almost instinctually against the law against the language we're doing most of what we're doing. And, 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 and the last comment is really interesting because it, it, it hasn't been said enough. Idle no more, which Nadan talked about. You know, in the middle of the winter, these indigenous kids and young people come out. And, you know, I say in the middle of the winter. It's not Paris. It's not Washington, right? And, and, and start a protest movement, which essentially is the beginning of bringing down a government and make, opening up the possibility of some real changes. We have, we what have, happened I just to the population of Canada in, in giving recognition we've to got about, indigenous kids? We've got about know? four minutes, and I do want to allow uh, one last question. Olivia and Nigan, if you want to comment I'll be briefly. Short. Um, those kids, the people that came, in fact, are exercising their citizenship Absolutely. responsibility. Because for me, citizenship means that you have a feeling that you can make a difference. Your thoughts, your action can make a difference, can make the city or the country, the world, our earth, a better place to be. But if you are so alienated and so feeling disempowered or so lied to so many times with empty promises, then that sense of alienation doubled and tripled. And it's very difficult for people to become a full participant. So really, citizenship is about feeling that you have the power to make a difference and are engaged in trying to make a difference. But we have to deal with equality and human rights first, because if not, then a lot of people are feeling alienated because they don't know that they have the power to make a difference. Nigan. Uh, so two things. The, I think that one actually, I'm going to say a little contrary, but really I'm saying the same thing. But the, uh, there's, the, I think one of the biggest problems has been the focus on a monologue approach with human rights. Human rights is without any responsibility because when there's when we make human beings the, the center of all things, therefore we completely forget. Really, our relationships don't matter if we can't drink the water and we can't eat eat anything. And so uh, I think that it is the responsibility. And I'm on the board of the of the Islamic um, Islamic Social Service Agency in Manitoba. I think it's one of my most important roles because I uh, I work with Islamophobia and xenophobia, mm -hmm. and I think it's. It is my responsibility to do that because uh, not only is it important, because uh, but it, it's my it's not my right to do it. It's my responsibility to try to create something better so that that little girl over there, um, you know, she just gave a speech the other day uh, in French in a French competition about and her, her this, the title to her the title to her speech was why I should not be speaking French, and and it's not because she doesn't love French because she actually loves French. The entire speech is about how much she loves French but that she was wondering, why don't I speak Cree? This is Nagan's daughter. That's citizenship, yeah. right? So there she is over there, so yeah. Sarah. <laughs> that, that for me is citizenship. That's the definition of it. And I do that, and she's doing that for people in the Islamic community too, because she wants to uh, have that kind of community. Okay. I'm gonna have to ask you to be very brief. I wonder if it's time to stop talking about Canadian citizenship and talking about sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty, building that. <laughs> uh, yes, but, <laughs> but, I, but I also want to say that, you know, if you talk to, I think it's, uh, it is critically important today, and most people will say, when you've got a situation, you've got 99.9% .9 of the land, most of it's stolen, and 0.1%, which is denoted as title, 
and uh, most of us didn't want title. We were for, it was forced upon us, and now we're, we're working with it to try to get back relationships with that 99.9%. Um, clearly, we need to talk about ownership, and clearly we need to talk about land uh, restitution, clearly. But at the same time, sovereignty for us, as I showed you before, was about sharing. It was about community, and that's what we tried teaching others. So sovereignty is not just about the Westphalian model. Yeah, so the, the, I mean, I totally agree. Our problem is we enter into these discussions as a continuation of the, of, of the model that caused the problem, right? And so what Nagant is saying is, and what we're saying is, we can't continue this conversation if we simply keep going down this linear, rational road, which is about simplified ideas of ownership. We have to get to a place of justice, but one of the ways of getting there is to, is to change the nature of the discussion. And I think there's a willingness to do that among many people. Uh, not in two departments in Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking Negan Sinclair, Olivia Chow, and John Ralston Saul. I also want to thank our Big Thinking series sponsors, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Universities Canada, and especially today, the Canada Foundation for Innovation. Je souhaite également remercier notre hôte, l'Université Ryerson, d'accueillir le Congrès 2017. Please, before you go, I want to remind you about one thing. Tomorrow, Big Thinking, featuring Wade Davis, professor and BC Leadership Chair in Cultures and Ecosystems at Risk at UBC. He's going to be discussing the grassroots fight to save the sacred headwaters of the Stikine, Skeena, and Nass Rivers from industrial development right here tomorrow at 12.15. Please join us. Thank you very much. <laughs>